Good evening. Um, thank you very much for tuning in to our fourth debate of term. Rome's fall continues to be one of the most hotly debated topics in history. Its causes and its effects have been vociferously contested. Was Rome's collapse caused by the barbarians at the gate, institutional decline, or something more eerily familiar? Some may regret the loss of Roman culture, learning and art that precipitated it. Others may argue that Rome's fall freed millions from barbarous rule and let other civilizations flourish. These are the debates we will be discussing this evening with our motion, this house regrets the fall of Rome. These debates remain important because while, while the learning Rome lent us was learning on their terms and in their language, it is a language we still speak today. We are therefore left wondering, is Rome our progenitor, an alien or our nemesis? On this call tonight, we have four eminent guest speakers from the classical world and two student speakers who will be debating the topic tonight. There is also the opportunity for you as an audience to submit any questions or raise any points of information in response to the speeches you hear. So please do uh, do so by following the link um, in our description below as usual. Uh, please also remember we will be voting at the end of tonight's debate. The poll is linked below and you can use this as an opportunity to decide whether you agree with the motion, despise it, or for whatever nuanced reason, feel the need to abstain. Now, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker for the side proposition, Dr. Daisy Dunn. Daisy is an award-winning author, classicist, and cultural critic. Her most recent books include In the Shadow of Vesuvius, A Life of Pliny, Of Gods and Men, 100 Stories from Ancient Greece and Rome, and the Ladybird Expert book on Homer. For their publications, she was interviewed by the Sunday Times. Daisy has contributed to the BBC World Service LBC, Talk Radio, among others, and she recorded two films for the BBC, Ideas, in 2019. Daisy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Edward Gibbon may have called the fall of Rome the most awful scene in the history of mankind, but at least he got a book out of it. Uh, his magisterial decline and fall was born out of a moment's rather depressive musing on what had become of Rome. And I wonder, when you visit the ancient city today and you cast your eye about the ruins of the Forum as he did, do you not feel the same? Do you not look at the fractured columns and the broken pediments and think how amazing this must have looked? Um, what happened? Where, when and where were all these skills and this great ambition lost? Where, oh, where did it all go wrong? Well, I'll tell you, uh, with the fall or the transformation or the revolution or whatever you want to call it of the Western part of the Roman Empire in the fifth century of our era. First, those brutish Goths broke in, uh, setting fire to the Basilica Amelia, setting fire to palatial residences and attacking elderly women. Uh, then came the Vandals, uh, plundering temples and taking thousands of people captive. And this all before that fateful year of 476. And I, I bid you now to consider some of these early casualties um, because the sack of Rome and the attacks that followed were very much saw the destruction uh, of, of some very highly revealing memorials to Rome's greatness. During one of the battles between the Romans and the Goths, uh, the mausoleum of Emperor Hadrian was used or rather misused as a fortress and statues that dedicated its summit torn down and used as missiles. At some point, uh, the ashes of the emperor himself were scattered mercilessly to the wind as well. And yet not such, not even such sort of brutal um, acts of desecration could erase the memory of Hadrian. Uh, after all, he was a man who sensibly withdrew the Roman army from Mesopotamia and averted an, another war with Parthia. A man who was so loved by and so in love with Greece that he was worshipped there uh, as a hero, if not as a god. Uh, a man who, like many of his predecessors, really adored the customs and the traditions of other peoples. It was never really uh, an emperor's way to foist his Romanness upon others. 
um, we mustn't let our ideas about imperialism today colour our view of what it was actually like to live within the Roman Empire. Now I can see that, um, of course, in the early years in particular, there was a degree of coercion and I can't stand here and pretend that, that slavery didn't remain endemic and that was obviously a great tragedy. At the same time, we're not talking here about the British Empire. Um, the Roman Empire, it didn't fall because its subjects were desperate to be free of it. On the contrary, there actually were a number of people who clamoured for Roman citizenship. Uh, wars were fought in the interest of obtaining it. From Italian towns to the further reaches of the globe, um, there was a real desire for the political and the legal and the economic benefits, not to mention the sort of sense of togetherness and community that being a part of the Roman Empire could bring. These people understood and anticipated correctly that um, they could combine their own culture with Romanists, that the two could sit side by side. Hadrian, for one, uh, should be noted, he didn't come from Rome itself, he was born in what's now Spain. Uh, and as an ardent lover of other cultures, he picked up on a lot of their influences and incorporated them into his rule. And that's very evident from his artistic record. If you look at uh, the Temple of Venus in Rome, uh, his lovely villa at Tivoli with its great Egyptian and Greek influences, uh, the Pantheon, for goodness sake, and I say very much uh, with his case, uh, look on his works, you mighty and despair. Because architecture really is, um, a very important measure of a city. It's a source of pride, it's a source of strength, it's a source of identity. Uh, and I think we can safely say the case for the architectural splendor that followed the Western, uh, the, the fall of Rome in the Western part anyway, is a very, very weak one. If we really need persuading of how much was lost by, uh, as a result of the fall of Rome, um, we really do need to look at East versus West, uh, where the West declined, the East continued to flourish and the empire, we should note, continued here right the way through to the mid 15th century. And as a consequence of this, the Eastern part became home to the greatest city of the post-Roman period, Constantinople, uh, which was home to a host of architectural delights, among many others, Hagia Sophia, of course, which was influenced in part by the Pantheon. Now, Hadrian was no saint, and uh, no sort of right-minded person today can sit here and pretend that uh, he was, um, we have to look at his sort of brutal quashing of the Jewish revolt, among much else. Um, the Romans could be, and were, very heavy-handed. But to champion the Roman Empire over the world that followed is not to, uh, to endorse every act taken by all of its rulers. It's not to be an apologist for everything that happened there. It's not to call the empire perfect. Rather, this is a question of balance. It's an assessment of life before and life after, a comparison. The opposition may well say that life is better for us today as a result of Rome's fall than in, say, third century Rome. But I would ask them, how long did that take? How many centuries of substandard living and crummy culture had to be endured? How many lives were cut short of their potential before the benefits, as they will have them, of the 2016 referendum, I mean, the fall of Rome, could be felt? Well, I'll tell you, it took in the region of a thousand years before the standard of living came anywhere close to that enjoyed by the Romans. Hmm. I would ask you, was that weight really worth it? I would say no. Had the empire continued, then the standard of living enjoyed by normal people, we're not talking about elite people, but normal people would have been a lot better than it would have been for those who had to sort of live in the wake of Rome's fall. Not least of all here in Britain, which really did uh, endure a, a terrible downfall really after this period. Um, we sort of see stone building with stone replaced with st uh, building with wood. Um, pottery becomes in such a sort of short supply that it's not unheard of for people to actually reuse uh, funeral urns for cooking. So that's how bad uh, it got. 
So it really wasn't a case of Romans coming to nice little land agreements with the Germanic peoples after the fall. Um, citizen wit citizens witnessed, as I've said, a great deal of brutality and upheaval, and also um, sheer hypocrisy, really. Um, vandals have trampled over their culture and then actually borrowed liberally from it as well, um, using their sort of Roman bars, Roman music, Roman clothes. Um, really, the Roman way of life remained very much the envy of the world. Now, the empire, of course, had its ups and downs. Um, it's, uh, there were sort of moments, definitely, there were times when uh, it looked as though it was going to be sort of swept away completely and never recover. But it also had a remarkable ability to bounce back. Um, I think if you think back to the last decades of the Roman Republic, uh, in the first century BC in particular, there was a real fear at that time that that was the end of Rome, that Rome was dead. But it wasn't. Um, it was reborn and blossomed into something new. Now, internally, at least, I would argue that Rome is, was in a worse state after the assassination of Julius Caesar than it was uh, after Romulus Augustulus, the last emperor, was deposed. And who oversaw that earlier revival? It was Augustus, whose mausoleum uh, incidentally went the same way as Hadrian's in this period. Uh, Augustus ushered in the Pax Romana, he uh, reformed the constitution and rebuilt Rome. And given how much he achieved in just a few short decades, um, I mean, tell me that under the right leadership, Rome could not once again have risen like the Phoenix in the sixth century. The fall of Rome, I maintain, should be a source of regret for anyone who values high culture. Um, it's not for nothing that Rome continues to be spoken about today in almost all quarters of our lives. Um, comparisons are constantly being made with it, uh, from the Rome sort of building programs to their uh, education, their engineering, the creation of awe inspiring, inspiring art and literature, to their rhetoric. Um, perhaps we're witnessing a mere, very mere shadow of that uh, this evening. Uh, to their education and uh, their, sort of their food, their eating habits, a lot of their food, need I remind you, they brought over to Britain. So we live forever in the Romans' debt. No one else, not the Egyptians, not the Mongols, not even the Tudors are spoken about uh, so consistently today. So I think we need to sort of think to ourselves, how far might we have come had Rome never fallen? So it is very much with regret that I view the decline and fall of this really very versatile and enterprising people. And I think it is with regret that this house, this home to the spirit of oratory honed by Cicero and the great forefathers of debate ought to view the fall of Rome. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Daisy, for your speech. Um, that was great to hear. Uh, we shall now move on to our first speech uh, for side uh, opposition. Um, and our first speaker for the opposition is Professor Walter Schiedel. Uh, Walter is a professor of ancient history at Stanford University. He's the world's second most cited Roman historian in an active faculty position. He has published over 200 papers and reviews um, on five monographs, including Escape from Rome, The Failure of the Empire and The Road to Prosperity. Walter, you have our ears. Thank you. Well, was the fall of the Roman Empire a lot of fun? I don't think so. I'm, I'm glad I wasn't there, but most history wasn't a great deal of fun for most people. And in the end, not that much changed. Under Roman rule and will here, I'm sure Brian is gonna tell us in a few minutes, some Romans had flush toilets, that's great. But you know, most people under Roman rule were poor, they were illiterate, they were sick, they often died young. After the fall of Rome, most people were poor, illiterate, sick, and often died young. And since Britain came up, in fact, after the fall of Rome, people in Britain had taller bodies, remarkably, than under uh, Roman rule, probably because there was better diet, less inequality, less exploitation, less oppression. But that's not actually the point. Uh, we are here to debate because the proposition is very straightforward. This house regrets the fall of Rome. This house, not people who lived 1,500 or 1,000 years ago, should we regret the fall of the Roman Empire? I don't think so, because we no longer live in those conditions. And that is exactly because the Roman Empire fell and never came back. 
That's the one thing that made everything else possible, that made the emergence of the modern world possible. Now, in order to get from there to here, from ancient to modern, a number of things have to change. You need new politics, you need a new economy, you need new knowledge, and you need new values. None of those things were available under the Roman Empire or in any large empire in history, in fact, that we know about. Why is that? Because those things are difficult to create, and they are most likely to appear in an environment that is fragmented, where there's a lot of pluralism, a lot of competition, lots of different parties, lots of different players, different options, experimentation side by side. That's the exact opposite of what you get in a super empire like Rome or China, for that matter. Now, ingredient number one, if you would like to have some political rights or liberties, or at least protections against despotism, it's helpful to have some degree of popular participation, of involvement, representation in the political process. Roman Empire got rid of this. They got rid of democracy in the Greek city-states. They even got rid of their own republic, which they had in place, to replace it with military dictatorship that lasted for hundreds of years. Now, when all this had fallen apart in the Middle Ages, kings were much weaker, right? You remember the Magna Carta. Bargains like this were struck all over medieval Europe in this period because kings were weak. They had to hold their noses. They had to bargain with their nobles and bishops and representatives of cities and entire regions to get anything done. And those arrangements never fully went away. That's why we have parliaments. That's ultimately why we have democracy. Um, today. Nothing like this would ever have happened in the material Roman Empire. It didn't happen in any other large empires either, because why would omnipotent emperors want to put up with this kind of thing? Why would they want to bargain with ordinary people? That's just a big pain. Second ingredient, if you want to modernize your economy, you need people to get this done. You need entrepreneurs, you need innovators, you need capitalists. And if, if you don't particularly like them, it pays to be nice to them. And that's exactly what happens after the fall of Rome and merchants and artisans and bankers, they would clump together, form their own associations, their guilds, their networks, which allowed them to hold their own against kings and feudal lords. They would create safe spaces for themselves and their businesses. And then once they had gotten really successful and influential, states started protecting them and um, enacting legislation in their favor for a very, very simple reason, because states were constantly competing with other states in Europe. And in order to pay for endless war, to borrow the money, they had to be what we now call pro-business. And it turns out, if you look at history, the most pro-business societies were the ones that did the best job. We may not like this kind of narrative, but in the end, those early capitalists, those businessmen, they were mostly men, got the job done and delivered the goods. Third ingredient is knowledge. If you want to create a world uh, of greater prosperity, of knowledge, of human flourishing, you need to have a better understanding of the universe. You have to be able to manipulate nature, the universe, to human benefit in industry, in medicine, in any number of different um, domains. Now, this is not something that just falls from the sky. Um, there has to be critical inquiry. And the people undertaking the critical inquiry, the thinkers, the scholars, the tinkerers, the, the iconoclasts, they have to be able to go wherever the evidence leads them, even if that doesn't please established authorities. That was very hard, as we know, in Europe after Rome with the church and censorship and all kinds of obstacles, but it did happen. And it happened once again for the same reason, because of fragmentation, pluralism and competition. If your ideas weren't popular where you were, you could move somewhere else. And if you discovered something that actually worked, well, the authorities, the people in power would take note. They would support you. They would reward you. They would develop your ideas so they could better compete with other states. That was bad news for peace, but it was good news uh, for science and technology and very bad news for Luddites. Nothing like this happened in the Roman Empire. There had been a lot of scientific progress, investigation among the Greeks. The moment the Romans take over, they bring hundreds of years of peace and stability, virtually no genuine innovation. 
beyond cement. There is more of the same, a lot more of the same, but ultimately just more um, of the same. Doesn't mean that big empires can't invent useful things. If you think of China, right, gunpowder and floating compass and printing and all kinds of things. But look at the people who made the most of this. It was Europeans who adapted and embraced these innovations because they used them to compete. They needed gunpowder to shoot other Europeans and they needed uh, the compass to fight over trade routes and they needed printing to compete over human minds. If you think of the Reformation literacy, people being able to read for themselves, which is really, really important if you want to create a civil society. None of this ever happened in a large traditional empire. Fourth ingredient, values. If you want these changes, these developments to become sustainable, you need to embrace values that go beyond the standard aristocratic values of owning land, fighting wars, and praying. You need to value commerce. You need to value the people who engage in business, in commerce, in trade, in finance. That you will, something you won't find in traditional empires. You have these entrenched ruling classes who think they are better than money-grubbing people who engage in these commercial ventures. They look down on them. They don't give them a voice in politics. They exploit them whenever uh, it is uh, opportune. That happened in Rome. It happened in many other empires. It did not happen in Venice or in Amsterdam or in London, in small post-Roman states where commercial elites were more and more influential and those were exactly the societies that spearheaded the transformation uh, to modernity. If you are trying to find bourgeois values in any large traditional empire in Rome or elsewhere, I wish you all the best because you're going to come up short. And that's it. Those are the four ingredients. That's the basic package you need to get from A to B. Doesn't mean you have to love everything about the modern world. There are lots of drawbacks about the process of getting there, the problems we face today. But consider the alternatives. The average person today in the world lives almost three times as long as people used to live in the past. The average person in the world today makes 15 times as much as people did in the past, up to 100 times as much in rich countries. And the stock of useful knowledge that we have built up has grown beyond anybody's wildest dreams. We can even have a, zoo, a union debate on Zoom as we do uh, right now. None of this would ever have happened if the Roman Empire had persisted or if it had been replaced by a similarly overbearing monopolistic uh, superstate. We can regret all kinds of things in history, but that's the one thing we shouldn't really regret at all. Since we are, well, at least virtually in Cambridge, I guess I can expect you to be familiar with the famous question in the Monty Python movie, The Life of Brian, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, for us, the answer is very, very straightforward. Best thing the Romans ever did for us was to go away, never come back, and let other people build a very different kind of world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Walter, for that uh, frank and, and great speech. Um, right, we shall now move on to our uh, second speaker for the proposition tonight. Uh, our second speaker is Professor Brian Ward Perkins. Uh, Brian is a history fellow at Trinity College, Oxford, uh, and the chair of the Oxford Centre for Late Antiquity. Uh, he has written a number of publications in this area, including his much discuss discussed book, The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, in which he challenges dominant assumptions that the fall of Rome was both largely peaceful and the start of a positive cultural transformation. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Freddie. Well, I realize that in the current climate, I'm being asked to defend the indefensible. I'm being asked to defend an empire. And empires are deeply out of fashion. We should be tipping statues of Augustus into the Tiber, you know, as we speak, instead of defending it. But um, I can entirely agree with that point of view. I mean, the exploitation of other people uh, by a dominant power, by military force to its own advantage, is, I think, a very bad thing. And the Roman Empire, at its origin, is exactly that. Uh, it was a Roman military force imposing its power over other people and exploiting them. And it was bitterly, bitterly resisted. Uh, 
we are virtually in Cambridge, I, I'm actually in Oxford, uh, and in Cambridge we should be very proud of our Queen, Boudicca, who rose in revolt against Roman oppression and fought heroically in order to defend uh, her own power within East Anglia. So I'm not going to defend the Roman Empire in its origins. I think it was an exploitative and unpleasant uh, institution. But it changed remarkably over 300 years. By the fourth century, it was an empire only in name. In other words, it's ruled by an emperor. In every other respect, it was a remarkably balanced and unified state. At the end of the third century, uh, Italy, previously the center, exploitative center of the empire, loses its taxation exemption and pays tax exactly like every other province uh, within the empire. In 212, the emperor Caracalla gave citizenship to every free man within the empire. And from that point onwards, everybody, provincials as well as Italians, were equal under the law. And in fact, as Daisy's already noted, I mean, even emperors, I mean, ceased to be Italian. I mean, Hadrian wasn't an Italian. And in fact, no emperor of the fourth century is an Italian. They almost all come from the Balkan provinces. And people like great emperor Constantine, uh, he's born to a family uh, from the Balkans. He's proclaimed emperor in York. I mean, the Roman Empire isn't anything like the British Empire. It's become a single unified state. Most telling of all, nobody actually wanted to get out of it. Every single modern empire has been characterized by people wanting to get out of it. And that's what brought down the Soviet Empire, it's what brought down the British Empire, the Belgian Empire, the French Empire, you name it. That's what brought modern empires down. It is absolutely not true of the Roman Empire. The provincial ruling classes wanted to stay uh, within it. Now, that's not to say that everything was wonderful within the Roman Empire. There was slavery, uh, there was the oppression uh, and marginalization of uh, women, there was autocracy, uh, as Walter has rightly pointed out. But, of course, uh, if the empire had continued, uh, those things would have changed. I mean, why not? I mean, why not have the rise of democracy uh, within an autocracy? Why not have the emancipation of slaves? Why not have the emancipation of women? The thing that's also is when we think about the empire, why did people actually, why were they happy to be within it? It's actually very obvious. It brought peace. Uh, Europe and the Mediterranean had a period of prolonged peace, periodic civil wars, but those civil wars are actually rather civilized civil wars fought between armies. They don't actually involve the civilian population. Um, civilized civil wars. Peace, basically. The Mediterranean, for its only time in its entire history, is a peaceful lake. With that, uh, and here I would disagree radically with Walter, goes an extraordinary commercial boom, uh, a mass of trade uh, crossing the Mediterranean and indeed reaching up into Northern Europe. You just need to look at archeological sites uh, to see what extraordinary sort of technological developments there were. There was also technological development. Walter's mentioned uh, concrete, but that concrete did a hell of a lot. I mean, just look at the aqueducts. I mean, Rome had 11 aqueducts, uh, one of them carrying water from 57 miles away. Uh, and they built ports, they built roads, they did all sorts of wonderful technical things. I think, you know, had the Roman Empire continued in peace, we'd be on Mars by now. I don't think there's any doubt at all. As Daisy rightly said, just look at what happened afterwards. And Walter's argument may hold, but it does have to ignore 600 years of really terrible history. Uh, Europe 
falls apart into little warring states, the economy collapses. In Britain, people even forget how to make wheel-turned pottery. And making wheel-turned pottery is really basic. In Britain, literacy goes, all buildings in stone and brick go, wheel-turned pottery goes, coinage goes, and it is literally at least 600 years before you begin to see anything uh, remotely coming out of that. Had Rome survived, uh, we wouldn't be worrying about Brexit now because we'd be very happy uh, within a single empire that actually embraced not only Europe, but actually the entire Mediterranean with a common language uh, of interchange and discussion, a common currency and a flourishing economy. I have no doubt at all that we should regret the end of Rome. Um, thank you very, very much, uh, Brian, uh, for that speech uh, and for that clarity. Um, it's much appreciated. Uh, we shall move on to our uh, second speaker for uh, the opposition tonight. Uh, our second speaker is Tom uh, Holland. Uh, Tom is a classicist and renowned author of fiction and nonfiction. He has many books, including Rubicon, uh, The Last Years of the Roman Republic, uh, and In the Shadow of the Sword, um, uh, BBC Radio 4's uh, Making History. Um, I, I think, Tom, uh, I have to thank you in particular for not getting sick of us uh, and for very generously agreeing to speak at our Classics debate uh, for the second year in a row. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, I, I am a, a glutton for punishment. Um, so this motion, the motion is, this house regrets the fall of Rome. And I think that already we've seen a, a pattern here. Um, Daisy and Brian have focused very much on the fall of Rome. Was it a pleasant thing to uh, live through? Possibly not, um, particularly if you were a wealthy landowner and suddenly you didn't have your running toilets and your underground heating. Um, Walter has emphasised this house, i.e. this house at this moment in 2021. And that's what I want to focus on as well. I, we are virtually in Cambridge, the world's best university. Apologies to Walter, apologies to Brian. Um, would Cambridge, whatever it was back in Roman Britain, British times, could we imagine this settlement emerging to become the host of the world's best university had Rome not fallen? I think it would be absolutely inconceivable because we've been hearing a great deal from both Daisy and Brian about the wonderful world of uh, Hadrianic Philhellenism and so on. But the attitudes towards Britain of the Romans was generally one of broad contempt. And this was one that spanned the entire spell of Britain's um, presence within the Roman Empire. Uh, Britain was, of course, peripheral to the metropole. We've heard about how wonderful it was that the Romans joined the Mediterranean, became Mare Nostrum. Britain was an island stuck out in the Northern Ocean. It was always peripheral. Um, it's incredibly telling that as far as we know, there were no senators from Britain, no senators at all. Um, it's, we, we heard from Daisy, the Romans could be heavy handed, indeed they could. And the a legacy of, if you were um, a Briton living in the vicinity of Hadrian's Wall, I think the heavy handedness of the Roman occupying forces would have been a feature of your life right the way up into the um, early fifth century when Roman rule collapsed. And perhaps most tellingly of all, if we're looking at the prospect of um, Cambridge becoming a great intellectual and cultural center under Roman rule, the attitude of the Romans from the first century BC right up to the end of the fourth century BC towards the very idea that Britons might be able to contribute anything to culture was one of utter hilarity. So when Julius Caesar sails to Britain, the result, the, the response of Cicero back in Rome is to make sneering jokes about what on earth will he bring back? I'm sure he might bring some slaves, but it's not as though he's going to be bringing back any literary critics, is it? <laughs> This is a tremendous joke for Cicero. And it's clearly one that runs all the way through the centuries as they go on and on and on. We can know this because um, towards the end of the fourth century, we, there is a, a poet in, in what's now Bordeaux called Ausonius, 
who is informed of um, the very first known poet writing in Britain, um, a guy called Silvius Bonus. And Bonus, of course, means good. And Asonius cannot get over the fact, firstly, that a Briton is writing poetry, and secondly, that this guy dares to call himself good. And so he writes a whole sequence of epigrams, ripping the piss out of poor Silvius, saying, how could any Briton be good? The very idea is completely shocking. And so perhaps that is why, despite what Brian said, actually, at the beginning of the fifth century, there was a Brexit. The Britons did not want to stay in the Roman Empire. According to Zosimus, the Britons cast off Roman rule, cast off Roman law. And so this prototypical aspect of Brexit, it happened way back in the early fifth century. And I think it reflected what was an enduring and broad seated sense of dissatisfaction that the Britons felt with a role that was not in any way paradisical. It was brutal, it was autocratic, it was militaristic. We've heard from Brian about these peaceful civil wars. The civil wars that were going on and were being fed by military commanders in Britain were extremely brutal. And one of the reasons why Britain imploded in the wake of um, the withdrawal from the empire was precisely the fact that it had become so militarized. It was a militarized society. It kind of exploded. So I think the idea that um, that, uh, that, that uh, Cambridge could possibly have become a, a global center of intellectual expertise under Roman rule is one for the birds. Now, Cambridge is a university. Would universities have emerged under the Roman world? Again, no. The university is a highly culturally contingent institution. And it emerges again, I think, very specifically as a result of what happens when Rome falls. When Rome is sacked in 410, obviously this causes huge problems for Christians. Um, how is it possible, uh, non-Christian Romans say, that God has allowed this to happen? The person who steps up to the plate and answers this question is, of course, Augustine, who says that um, there is a city of God and there is the city of man, and Rome is the city of man. And Rome, Augustine says, belongs to a dimension called the cyclum. The cyclum is essentially the span of living memory. It's the flux of things. And great empires, great cities, even the Roman Empire, like individual human lives, are like mere flotsam and jetsam cast upon a great flowing stream, borne away upon the floods of time, the swirls of time, into oblivion. Is humanity therefore destined completely to be cast into oblivion? No, Augustine says, because there is the radiant eternity of the city of God and the Christian church provides a bond, a religio, that serves as a kind of life raft. You can cling to that and people, Christians, people who accept Christ into their lives will be redeemed from the flux of the cyclum and will be um, will attain the eternity of heaven. And this establishes a kind of a, a, a division within European society between the cyclum, the dimension of flux, and the dimension of the city of God, which can be obtained through religio, that becomes fundamental to European civilization, and by the 11th century is weaponized. And it can be weaponized because there is no powerful imperial state. This is what enables the church over the course of the 11th century, the Roman church, to establish itself, ironically, as the supreme sovereign state in Western Latin Christendom. And um, to say to uh, kings, to emperors, to those who would uh, uh, try and resurrect the, uh, the, the rule of the Caesars, to say, back off, you belong in the dimension of the cyclum. We, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the priests, the bishops, the popes, the cardinals, um, who offer religio to uh, the Christian people, we are separate and distinct from this dimension of um, of, of, the, of the cyclum. And it's the desire on the part of the church to establish frameworks of law that will enable this sovereign state to function and to flourish that results in the 12th century with the establishment of uh, 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 the, the first university at Bologna. And the example of this spreads to Paris, to some place in the middle of England, I can't remember, 
and then in due course to Cambridge. And these institutions, which are set up under the aegis of the papacy and the papacy rules that they should be independent and separate from the jurisdiction of bishops, in time emerged to become the great smithies of the uh, Western intellectual revolutionary tradition, born of uh, revolution, born of the, the great papal convulsion that um, sunders these twin dimensions apart of church and state, that establishes the very idea of these their existence. These, over the course of the centuries that follow, become enshrined to establish our present day understanding of the secular and of the religious. And so if today, you wonder how is it that we are able to sit here on Zoom debating in a university? It's due to the fact that universities were established and established with the traditions that we uh, that this session bears witness to to this day. Those institutions would have been unimaginable under Roman rule. And that's why if this house regrets the fall of Rome, this house essentially is wishing that it did not exist. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Tom, for your speech. Um, as a chair, I have to remain neutral and I can't comment um, uh, on whether I agree or disagree, but I must say your appraisal of this university is spot on, so thank <laughs> you. Um, uh, we do have a, a question uh, which was uh, submitted a little late um, and it's for uh, Daisy uh, and Brian, but Brian, I believe you're happy to take this one, so I will just read it out. Uh, the question is from uh, Alexander, who is uh, from the University of Edinburgh, and he studies ancient history and classical archaeology. Um, the question is, and I'm just going to shorten it slightly, does the lamentation of the fall of the Roman Empire not invite modern imperialists or white supremacists to justify their own actions, arguing that, that, that we would be better off under an empire is eerily similar to the arguments of many empires in the 19th and 20th centuries? Question mark. Um, I would entirely agree, uh, but as I argued, uh, that's only by taking a very simplistic view about what the Roman Empire was about. It's saying the Roman Empire is exactly like modern empires, in other words, an exploitative, racist institution. Uh, the Roman Empire by its end, end was not that. It was, as I argued, in fact, a remarkably unified state, arguably a nation in which people uh, with which people identified. It was also deeply unracist. I mean, that's not to say there was no racism. I mean, there's racism in all societies, even in societies that claim they don't have it. Uh, but actually, um, as Daisy said with the Emperor Hadrian, and as I said, uh, they took their emperors from all over uh, the uh, imperial world, uh, and also their civil servants and their senators, possibly not quite so many from Britain, as Tom argued, uh, but it was in fact a remarkably unified state. And it was also a state which respected other cultures. I mean, Greek remained a language of culture and civilization. It wasn't suppressed by Latin. And in fact, vernacular cultures in Syriac, uh, in Coptic, also uh, thrived under the empire. So yes, people can use the Roman empire in that way, but they're wrong to do so because they're doing so from a position of ignorance. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, Tom, did you want to come in there? I, I think they're absolutely right to. Um, I mean, absolutely uh, no coincidence that um, the emblem of fascism is uh, derives from ancient Rome. Um, Mussolini completely modelled himself on Augustus and Hitler was directly inspired by the example of the Roman Empire. Um, I think that the question is entirely germane. Uh, Daisy, I'll let you wrap this one up. Oh, sorry, Daisy, you're on mute. Apologies. I'd say though, with, when you're looking at Hitler and you're looking at Mussolini, they're not using it, they're misusing it. I mean, whole books are written under the Third Reich. Um, completely misunderstanding, purposely, Plato. I mean, that, and you know, Greece and Rome were contorted. I think it's a sort of a, a strange argument to make. 
Uh, thank you for that. I suspect everyone on the call could probably go on, but uh, for the for the sake of continuing with the uh, the format of debate, um, maybe we can save that for uh, for after we uh, <clears throat> we go offline. Uh, right. So we will move um, on to our final speech uh, for the proposition tonight. Uh, our final speaker is a student. Uh, the speaker is Matthew Tull. Uh, Matthew is currently reading for an MPhil in history. Uh, he is from Peterhouse College, uh, and his special subject is the Byzantine uh, Empire. Uh, Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Freddie. Um, well, since I find myself so massively intellectually outgunned this evening, um, I decided that my only option was to embrace the spirit of the sophists um, and reinvent the question entirely, um, retreating back onto ground much more familiar to myself. Accordingly, I will argue that Rome did not fall to the fire and swords of the Goths, nor to the rampaging horsemen of the Vandals, not even did it end when Odoacer deposed Romulus Augustulus. Rather, Rome ended a millennium later to the 17-ton cannons and the heavily armed janissaries of Suleiman the Magnificent, who finally conquered new Rome, Constantinople, the great imperial city. For the Roman Empire in the East, survived the tumult of the 5th and the 6th centuries, living on and flourishing. And these people continue to call themselves Hoi Romaioi, the Romans. And when the Seljuks overran Anatolia in the 11th century, they referred to themselves as the Sultans of Rum, the Sultans of Rome. But I can already hear the barbs of my opposition. All the Ottomans did was merely put out of its misery a state that was already shriveled, impoverished, and forgotten. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. For the Romans of Byzantium, even in their last centuries, produced art, literature, and philosophy of a breathtaking quality. And were it not for the Turkish invasion, would have undoubtedly gone on to produce even more and even greater. Whether it be the stunning mosaics in the Cora Monastery in Constantinople, completed in the early 14th century, whose extraordinary detail and narrative power surely number them amongst the greatest examples of all time. Or you can look to the Peribleptus Monastery in Mistra in the Peloponnese, whose fine frescoes are easily the equal of Giotto and his Italian contemporaries. In literature, we can admire the varied essays of Theodore Metakites, the great statesman, which are flushed with a pessimistic focus on the travails of man, which surely make him a humanist of rare sympathy. We can admire also the emperor, John Counter Cusinos, whose learned history of his own time, written in a fine Thucydidean style, surely qualifies him as one of the few contenders for the title of philosopher king. Indeed, in the realm of philosophy, the Romans showed more vivacity still. In the very last years of the empire, there emerged George Gemistus Plato, who was so dedicated to Plato that he eventually converted to a form of antique paganism. More than this, his work, The Laws, is surely the most radical political work of the Middle Ages, advocating common land, common property, and the rule of an intellectual elite, a work it should be noted he was competent enough to send to the imperial family. And earlier, when he had been advocating the cause of Orthodox Christianity, at the Council of Ferrara, Florence. He had so impressed Lorenzo de' Medici that he inspired him to go off and found the Academy of Plato in Florence. But the Romans could also produce Renaissance men, men like Vasarian, who fled after the fall of the city, came to Italy and converted to Roman Catholicism, eventually managing to make himself a cardinal. And twice, he almost managed to get himself elected Pope showing him the equal of those conniving political families which are so familiar to us from those times. Lastly, in theology also, we can admire 
Gregory Palamas, whose works and brand of orthodox mysticism are still much admired and much read today. So I ask, how could anyone not regret the snuffing out of a civilization whose light was still burning so brightly, so vividly, and so freshly? And yet, I think there is one more element whose loss must be lamented. And I think it can be best illustrated with a little story. So you've got to imagine the Turks have broken down the walls of the city and are pouring in. Constantine XI Palaeologus, the last Roman emperor, takes from his head and from his shoulders the imperial regalia and charges full pelt into the fray and there he falls. This act shows a spirit continuous from the very earliest history of the city, as told to us by Livy. A self-sacrificing heroism, which I think was one of the great tributes to the dignity and the glory of man. So I ask again, who would not mourn a spirit which wove so much into the rich tapestry of human achievement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Matthew, um, for that uh, interesting take on the motion. Uh, I think that added a refreshing uh, twist, so much appreciated. Um, we have just circling back to Tom's speech, actually, a question from the floor, um, and I'm quite keen to keep this format dynamic. So, uh, Tom, if I can ask this, um, I might direct this at you. Uh, the question is, is it not the case that the Roman Empire in its later stages allowed an educational and intellectual framework in the form of the church to emerge in which knowledge could be preserved during those dark 600 years uh, in which Professor Brian Ward Perkins spoke? Um, and uh, this, uh, this question is from uh, Imre Batal uh, at University College London. Uh, absolutely. I mean, basically, the only thing that the Roman Empire achieved was, was indeed to um, ground the church, thereby... Um, making Western civilization possible. Uh, Brian and Daisy, you're welcome to come in or we can move on to our final speaker. Yes, I mean, actually, I, if, if I were going to question Tom, I would have said uh, the Christian church was a creation of the Roman Empire. I mean, without the Roman Empire, it would never have happened. I mean, it's a chance that Constantine happens to decide to become Christian, and that it, he then, as it were, spreads it throughout the empire, it wouldn't be there without the empire. Uh, but, but that's not what we're arguing. What we're arguing about is whether we regret the fall of Rome or not. And the thing is, is that, that um, the church played such a seismic role over the course of the, uh, the 1500 years that followed the fall of the empire in the West, that um, essentially to talk about Western civilization is to talk about the influence of the church and the way that it's percolated out. The Roman Empire is the equivalent of the, um, you know, the birds that hatch the cuckoo's egg. But, but, but the empire was already being challenged by the church while it was still functioning. I mean, people like Augustine are writing when the empire is still right there. I mean, Cambridge, that wonderful place, uh, would perfectly well exist within a, a, a Roman empire still persisting. Well, Augustine is writing against a backdrop of, um, of, of the implosion of Roman power. Um, I mean, he ends up defending his city against a Vandal army. And it's telling, I think, that, uh, that Augustine's take on this division between church and state, between the, the secular and the religious, if we want to be anachronistic about it, is one that is bred of the peculiar circumstances of Roman implosion in the fifth century, in, in, in the fourth and fifth century. It's, it's not one that you see in the Byzantine world, in the Orthodox world. Um, so if you want a sense of what Christianity would have looked like had the Roman Empire not fallen, you can look at Russia. Yes, but you can, I mean, you can also look at, at, at Rome. I mean, uh, people like Ambrose and Augustine are challenging, I mean, imperial power, even in the fourth and fifth century. And if I may say so, both your and Walter's arguments all jump over about 700 years. Fine, Cambridge, 13th century creation, anything could have happened within the Roman Empire in that period. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's absurd to, you know, jump over those centuries and say, you know, merchants in Venice, 
intellectuals in Cambridge <laughs> could not have happened without the fall of the Roman Empire. It's just <laughs> wiping out six Tom, 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 I will, I will allow this as, as the closing okay. remark in this discussion. Brian, I'm sorry. Any, Brian, you say anything could have happened, but of course it couldn't have happened if the empire had stayed, because it would have stayed an autocracy, and mm. therefore it would have been operating under very, very precise parameters. It's precisely the fact that it implodes and collapses that enables the incredible wave of experimentation that really is the kind of the keynote of the fragmented European order that emerges from the rubble of the Roman Empire. And had there been the autocracy still in place, that experimentation would not have been possible. Well, thank you very much uh, both for that. I'm sorry to have to have uh, wrapped it up, but I'm just conscious of time. Uh, this is a uh, good proof, if ever there was any, that debates still can continue uh, on Zoom. Uh, so thanks for that lively discussion. Uh, right, we'll now move on to our final uh, speaker for this evening. Uh, our final speaker uh, is again a student, uh, or a former student, I should say, uh, Paul Norris. Uh, Paul is currently a pastoral assistant at Fisher House. Uh, he read English at Queen's College and graduated from the University of Cambridge uh, last year. Uh, Paul, you have our ears. When I first decided to join this debate, I thought of arguing in a similar vein to Matty that we should not regret the fall of Rome because the fall of Rome did not happen, at least not in the fifth century. Rome did not fall then, I thought, any more than a footballer falls after being tapped lightly on the shin. It was a temporary stumble, a stumble which allowed it to rise the unimaginable heights of the Roman Catholic Church, for which I'm now an employee, I should probably disclose. <laughs> but then I realized, no, this is wrong, and Matty is equally wrong for trying to claim that the fall of Rome could apply to the end of an empire which had not included Rome in its borders for more than a thousand years. What Matty celebrated in his speech was not lost in the fall of Rome, but instead were the fruits of the fall of Rome. Rome really did fall in the fifth century, and what rose in its place was as unimaginable and dramatic a shift as if Neymar, I don't really know who Neymar is, but I asked Robert for a, my, my brother for a uh, <laughs> football of his analogy, as if Neymar was knocked down by some, excess, by some excessive uh, eye contact from an opposing player and writhed on the ground for a moment, only to reveal a jetpack underneath his shirt and fly into the air. As, as convenient as this argument is from my ideological position uh, as a Roman Catholic and, and also from my physical position with uh, St. John Fisher looking literally over my shoulder, uh, I, I'm, I'm not talking about what happened after Rome's fall. I think that's been covered amply by Tom Water. I'm instead going to argue, in, really in response to Brian's point, uh, that the fall of the empire produces kind of 700 years of, of darkness, that uh, in and of itself, at the moment it happened, the fall of Rome was nothing to regret. Rome did fall, and we should be glad it did. If the proposition really admired Rome for all its good qualities, its military might, its technology, its gastronomic culture, its economy, its literature, its art, and its architecture, they would not regret that Rome fell, but that it did not fall sooner. It would have been better if the great city had been cut off in its prime, rather than limping on into an increasingly irrelevant, immobile, and incoherent dotage. Rome's fall was not a murder, nor a suicide, but a mercy killing. The problem was that once the empire that the empire became not so much top heavy as, as middle heavy. In the, in the third century, the emperor attempted to establish a, a more uniform governance structure as a result from, well, as we heard from Brian, how the, um, the Antonine constitution of uh, 12, uh, 212 gave a full Roman citizenship to every man who lived within the empire's borders. Uh, now, Brian implied this was a sort of far-sighted act of multiculturalism, but really it's, it's more like to been the result of the emperor's need for more tax revenue or more soldiers or, or possibly simply a sort of mad whim. But that's not so relevant to this debate as what the results of this decision were for Roman bureaucracy. Greater centralization, greater uniformity brought the need for Roman law, which had formerly applied only to Italy, to work for an empire of millions. This meant more experts, more managers, and worst of all, more lawyers. The size of the imperial civil service is estimated to have been between 30 and 40,000 salaried free men, many of them reaching the title of equestrian, an honour that had formerly been reserved for the upper echelons of society, ranking just below senator, but that was now doled out to local councillors uh, or those willing to pay a bribe. 
This was a self-propagating bureaucratic system that produced nothing. And when we say Rome fell, this was what we were talking about, this political system. These managers could produce no results because Rome no longer knew what it was for. It knew vaguely what it stood against as it had no trouble finding or inventing enemies and persecuting or ostracizing them with a vehemence which I think uh, challenges Brian's characterization of Rome as a tolerant proto-modern state. Whether it was barbarians, who were quite hazily defined, or Christians, or later non-Christians. Dialectical oppositions like these might produce some kind of meaning at first, but they sort of decline exponentially in meaningfulness until by the end, both sides have nothing really to contribute, a pattern we hopefully are not seeing out play, uh, seeing out tonight. Rome did not have a defining purpose. It stopped expanding. Its army became increasingly hard to distinguish from those it was supposed to fight against. Alaric, commander of the Visigoths who led the sack of Rome, had himself been a Roman soldier. And one possible reason that the Roman military was so ineffective in stopping his advance uh, was that the Roman military no longer existed. It had been folded into his forces. Pagan religion, once the lifeblood of Roman civic life, became a box to check on a form as officials certified that citizens had undertaken the proper sacrifices as a way of proving to the authorities that they were not Christian. Rome's technology was, as Brian rightly argued, impressive, uh, but te technology in itself is, is not, is not, is not, um, it's not inherently, it's not inherently meaningful. It, it presents opportunities without instructions, and Rome was not good at writing instructions. It was not good at putting the systems it made to any kind of purpose. And this was not just the nature of Rome in its last few years. This sense of drift was evident right from the beginning of the empire. It is captured by Seneca the Younger in his drama Diestes, where an insatiable Atreus pursues grander and grander schemes of revenge. When he is finally able to take his revenge on Diestes, he is satisfied for only a moment. He says, this is good, this is ample, this is enough now, even for me. But then he adds, why should it be enough? And the whole of Rome kept asking itself, why should this be enough? The only thing it was sure it possessed was excess. Its insatiable appetite for power and violence is most vividly embodied in the atrocities of the early emperors. And uh, if you prefer historical to a literary image of the decline of Rome, there is none better than Nero, who, according to Suetonius, Suetonius, maintained an audience at his musical performance through force. When he sang, no one was allowed to leave the theatre for any reason. We hear of women in the audience giving birth and of men being so bored with listening and applauding that they played dead and were carried out for burial. This is what Rome was by the end. It had run out of tunes, but would not stop singing and could only keep the people in place by blocking the exits. Its fall would perhaps have been lamentable if it had occurred sooner, but as it was, there was no tragedy in it, only melodrama. Just as Seneca's Thyestes is too overblown really to be a tragedy, so is, our, so is Rome's decline too overblown for its fall to have been regrettable or to be regrettable to us now. Rome's final years were not even terrible, they were monstrous. They were not pitiable nor fearful, they were simply empty. Rome went from being the home of uh, the figure that Nietzsche chose to epitomize his, his ubermensch, Caesar, uh, who lives out the noble virtues, who exist beyond good and evil, to the home of thousands of identical bureaucrats, of middle class, middle brow, middle managers, who embody Alistair McIntyre's definition of managers as people who are experts in nothing, who create for themselves moral fictions about effectiveness, utility, and efficiency to sustain their stranglehold on civilization, a stranglehold which inevitably squeezes out any remaining life. The fall of Rome then was a mercy and even its long decline, not something to regret. Great things are beautiful and great because they are temporary. Even because they were temporary, perhaps greatness is only possible posthumously. It is not because it has never fallen that we call Rome now an eternal city, but because it has died many times and lived many lives. And this is not something to regret. What the stagnation of classical Rome's final years shows is that when we try to make one life last forever, we have already died. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, Paul, for your speech uh, and for wrapping up this evening's debates. Um, 
Right. I, I saw um, I saw Brian and, and Tom, you were scribbling. I, I will say, because we haven't got any questions uh, for Paul's speech, if you wanted to raise a final point of rebuttal, you can. Um, otherwise, uh, we shall uh, wrap up tonight's debate. No. Excellent. Well, thank you so much um, to uh, everyone on the call um, for six fantastic speeches. Um, I enjoyed that very much. Uh, I hope our audience did uh, too. Um, thank you particularly to, uh, to Tom and Walter for joining uh, relatively last minute um, and for accepting my, my frantic invitation. Um, just as a reminder uh, to audience members, uh, you can still vote in the poll. The poll will be open uh, for about 10 minutes uh, after this uh, debate. Um, and then we will announce uh, the results uh, on uh, our uh, various social media channels. Um, so keep an eye out. Um, and uh, just as a plug for uh, the upcoming uh, events um, in the next week, uh, remember we have our women's debating workshop um, on Wednesdays. So if you like what you saw here and wanted to have a go um, at debating yourselves and learning the format, please do try that out. Um, and then we will be back at the same time uh, for a next Thursday's debate. Um, it's a geopolitical debate uh, on the ch a threat that China poses uh, to the United Kingdom. Uh, so please do uh, keep uh, tuned in. Um, that's all from us. Uh, thank you very much and have a great evening.